Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at Morphe's with the classic Soviet Cold War sniper rifle. This is the SVD Dragunov, and it's an original military Dragunov produced in 1974 at the Ishevsk Arsenal, the Ishevsk factory. And I think there's some interesting background to these that may not be all that well known to a lot of folks. So. I do, by the way, have a previous video out comparing the differences between this uh, pattern of rifle, the Tiger, which is the more modern Soviet commercial version of the Dragunov, and the NDM-86, which is the Chinese copy of the Dragunov. So if you're interested in the nuances of how the design's different, uh, check that video out. I will link to it in the description text below. But the original actual Dragunov, of course, dates back to, well, we're going to take this back to World War II, where the Soviets wanted a semi-automatic precision rifle, and they gave it a good try with the SVT-40, the Tokarev rifle, which was initially developed, introduced as the new sniper rifle for the Red Army, only to discover it had some pretty serious accuracy issues. It was not sufficiently... it wasn't acceptable as a sniper rifle, and the Soviets would end up uh, stopping production of the sniper variant, and they went back to making Mosin-Nagant 9130 PU snipers. And they would continue to use the PU as their standard issue sniper rifle, or designated marksman's rifle, for the first decade of the Cold War. It wasn't until 1957 that the design requirements for what would become the Dragunov were actually submitted to industry so the Red Army could get itself a new rifle. And what spurred this was actually NATO adoption of the 7.62 NATO cartridge. So it's important to note here, at the end of World War II, the Soviet Union makes a pretty radical shift in infantry small arms, and it adopts in the late 1940s, a whole suite of new infantry rifles chambering an intermediate cartridge. That's the 7.62x39. They have the AK, which is a substitute for the submachine guns, the new infantry rifle is the SKS, and the new infantry, uh, well, the squad machine gun is the RPD. And the PK machine gun, which we think of now as sort of the standard, you know, Warsaw Pact or Eastern a you know, small unit light machine gun, that didn't come around until the 1960s. During the 1950s, the closest thing the Soviet Union has to a... well, to a squad automatic weapon that's bigger than the RPD is the RP-46, which is the Degturev machine gun converted to belt-fed, and it's kind of clunky. Now, this intermediate cartridge is, we generally see it today, as a really good idea. It maximizes the firepower of the inv individual rifle, it allows controllable full auto from the shoulder for those infantry rifles, um, and we like it. And we often think uh, today, looking back, we, we look at the, NATO, the 7.62 NATO caliber adoption as a bad idea. Like the US dominated over NATO decision making and squashed like the really good cartridge the British had going, which was going to be a sort of intermediate cartridge, in favor of good big manly bullets. Well, what's interesting is the Soviets saw that adoption and saw it as a potential real threat. Because now, as they see it, in open field warfare, their units have a range disadvantage. The, the Allied, or the NATO units, can reach out with their 762 by 51 millimeter weapons. Mostly here we're talking about the squad machine guns. Like that FN mag can reach out farther than the Soviets can respond using something like the RPD. And they didn't, for logistical reasons, they didn't want to get rid of the RPD. They wanted to keep the squad machine gun in the same caliber as the squad rifles, and they liked the rifles being in intermediate cartridge. They weren't going to redesign the whole weapons uh, system to deal with this, but they needed some way to give that squad the organic capability to reach out and engage something like a NATO machine gun unit or anti-tank weapon at a range beyond what, say, the SKS or the RPD could actually handle. And so that is the justification for a 762 by 54 millimeter full power precision marksman's rifle. And before we tear this apart in just a moment, I want to point out this really isn't intended to be a sniper's rifle. There's a distinction to be made, if, even if it's a fairly vague and hazy distinction, between a sniper's rifle and a designated marksman's rifle. The sniper we think of today as the dude who spends three days crawling into a position to make the perfect one single opportune shot on a very high value target. That's not really what this was, well, it's not at all what this was designed for. This was designed to be an organic element of an infantry squad 
that was able to provide accurate fire out a little bit farther than the rest of the rifles. It was a designated marksman. So when you have a small precise target, it goes to this guy. If you had a, a larger target that requires suppressive fire, that task is going to go to the machine gunner. If you have, you know, each, each weapon in the squad has its specific uses. It's worth pointing out the SVD has a bayonet lug on it because it is part of the infantry squad and intended to be a cohesive part of any, say, bayonet charge that the squad might have to participate in. So in 1957, the design requirements for this system go out from the army, and there would be three designers that would submit rifles to meet the new specifications. Uh, one, of course, is Yevgeny Dragunov, who of course wins it, spoiler. Uh, one is Konstantinov, and the other is Simonov. Now, this is Sergei Simonov of the SKS, and he essentially builds a big stretched out large SKS. And it's not very accurate, and it's reliable, but doesn't fill the role, and he's eliminated pretty quickly from the competition. Konstantinov has a rifle that's actually pretty similar mechanically to Dragunov's. In fact, Konstantinov and Dragunov develop apparently a pretty decent friendship over the course of this competition, helping each other out. Konstantinov helps design the magazine for the Dragunov. Dragunov helps make more precise barrels for Konstantinov's rifle. They're both short stroke gas piston rotating bolt designs. But ultimately, when it comes down to the final testing, which is 1958-1959, Dragunov's rifle is the more accurate of the two. They both fulfill all the other requirements, but Dragunov's is more accurate, and he wins the competition. And Dragunov's an interesting character here. He was quite young. He was born in 1920. So when this is going on, he's just in his 30s. Uh, so a fairly young designer. He does have experience. He was trained at Ishevsk as a gunsmith. And then perhaps most importantly, he both had experience building target rifles, and he was a very accomplished target shooter himself. And I think that's the most important element here, is he really truly understood what was necessary to make an accurate rifle. And that set him up perfectly to design an accurate rifle. So let's pull this apart. And let me show you what Dragunov designed. The Dragunov is particularly relevant in military firearms development because it is the first purpose-built designated marksman's rifle. Up until this point, the marksman or sniper rifles were basically accurized, hand-picked uh, examples of standard service rifles that were modified with scopes. And it was here for the first time that a major military actually developed a rifle from scratch, from the ground up, that was not just a, a variation on their infantry system uh, for the designated marksman's role. So uh, this is a fairly long gun. It's 48 inches long. It's 1.2 meters long, but it's not as heavy as it looks. It comes in at about 10 pounds because it has a pretty thin barrel. It is fed using 10 round detachable box magazines, chambered for 7.62x54 rimmed, of course. We have a rail on the side of the receiver here for mounting a scope. Unlike the AK, this does use a milled receiver to give it the rigidity necessary for good precision. And this was developed alongside a new scope, the PSO-1 scope. It's four power, it's got a, a nice reticle to it, and I don't have a PSO-1 to go with this rifle. Here at Morphe's, this particular rifle, which I believe came uh, by way of Lebanon, I don't know how long ago, but it came in with this Yugoslav M76 Zrak scope. Uh, also a very cool scope from a similar time period, but this was developed for the Yugoslav M76 rifle. It will fit on this rail. I have left it off because it's not the appropriate correct scope for the Dragunov. We'll talk about the PSO-1 in a separate video. But that's the rail where it would attach. As a rifle to be used by the infantry squad, it does have backup iron sights that are essentially AK sights. There's the front sight. It is windage adjustable, so it can be nicely zeroed. We have a flash hider out here and a bayonet lug as well. I should mention, uh, there wasn't actually much change in Dragunov's design from the early trials versions to the final version. There were a couple changes. They added the flash hider, but the most substantive one is Dragunov, again, was a very successful competitive shooter. He designed the rifle with a rear aperture sight back here, knowing that that would be the more effective, more accurate type of iron sight to use. But in order to fit the military model of what everyone else, you know, what all everyone was trained on, they changed that before it was adopted to a basically an AK style uh, rear notch sight. All right, this looks like an AK. It is not an AK, but it does have the same style 
of safety lever. So that's fire that safe, it's semi-automatic only. In order to disassemble it, we are just going to take this lever and flip it around to the back, and then I can lift off the top cover. The recoil spring is housed inside the top cover here. I can then take the bolt, slide it back, and lift it out, or bolt carrier, the bolt and just rotates and comes out. The bolt is relatively AK-like, uh, but you'll notice there's no gas piston attached, because this is a short stroke gas piston. It is hammer fired, and has a pretty darn good trigger. It's not like a super duper competitive match trigger today, but for a military pattern rifle it's a pretty light crisp trigger. There's the hammer in the fired position. To access the gas system we have to push this lever down, unlock that, rotate it forward, and then the front uh, handguard cap will come off. There we go, we pull that forward, and then I can pop off both of the handguard panels. There's no heat shield in there, this isn't intended to be fired uh, rapidly or high volume enough to require a heat, an insulating heat shield. Here you can see we have a fairly thin barrel coming all the way out here, gas block there. Uh, this is, well we'll touch on the accuracy in a minute, but um, while this is, is good enough for initial shots, one of the very recognized shortcomings of the Dragunov, or essential compromises of the Dragunov, is that uh, you don't have to shoot very much before this barrel gets hot, and once it gets hot it will start shifting zero. The only way to prevent that is to have a much heavier barrel, which they didn't want to do out of the desire to have the gun light, mobile, and handy. All right, we have our gas piston out here. When you fire it's going to tap gas out of the barrel, of course, and this is going to reciprocate backwards. Comes back to here, there's a return spring on it, and the end of this gas piston punches through the top of the receiver there, where it is going to push on the top of the bolt carrier right there to cycle the action. All right, I can, if I pull back just the center rod here, I can pull out the gas piston and its return spring, just like the Tokarev. This is a three-part system. There's the piston head, and then this actually has multiple positions that I can set it on. So you can see the, the one marking there. If I push down this latch, I can actually rotate this over to position two. And that gives me more gas if the gun has gotten fouled. And of course, lest we forget, here are the receiver markings. They're on the bottom of the receiver, just in front of the magazine well. We have an Ashevsk uh, Arsenal mark, 1972 manufacture date. So this will have the this particular one will have the original one in 320 millimeter rifling. And then there's our serial number H183. All right, I can't quite fit this all the way out to the muzzle because it is a quite long gun, but there you have an SVD Dragunov field stripped. Ultimately, the SVD is adopted as a new weapon for the Red Army in 1963 and put into production. It was manufactured at Ishevsk, and only at Ishevsk. And I don't have any total production numbers, but it stayed in production for decades, typically with four figure thousands per uh, per year being made. I have a previous video where I talked to uh, Max Popyanker about the history of the SVD, and he mentioned looking into some of the factory records and finding, like through the 1970s, they were making four to seven thousand, five to seven thousand Dragunovs per year. At the same time, by the way, they were making about half a million Kalashnikovs each year. But um, this was a weapon that was intended to be issued one to every single squad in mechanized infantry units. So it really was a mass issue weapon. Not everybody got it, but it was a very common weapon, or was expected to be a very common weapon, and so they made many tens of thousands, well, they made hundreds of thousands of Dragunov rifles in total, although I don't have an exact number to give you. Now, a couple questions about accuracy and about rifling. This was initially developed with a rifling pitch rate of 1 in 320 millimeters, that's about 1 in 12.5 inches, and that was developed around a 200 grain commercial sporting cartridge, or sporting bullet. When the rifle was designed there was no precision 
ammunition being made in 762 by 54 by the Red Army. They were just going to use the standard 148 grain LPS ball ammunition for the thing. Well, Dragunov's a very accomplished sport shooter. He's not going to use the crappy machine gun ball ammo to develop his rifle. He's going to go find the best ammo he can, which is this commercial ammo, the brand name was Extra, that was being sold to sporting clubs in the Soviet Union, and it's a 200 grain bullet instead of 148. So he designs the rifle for that. Now, in military service, there never was, well, there would eventually be. In military service, they had to develop a new uh, precision rifle, or precision cartridge, which they did in the late 1960s. But before that, they wanted to use just standard ammunition. Again, like having a bayonet lug, the, the Dragunov gunner is a part of the squad. Uh, he's not separate, he's not special from the squad, he's just another one of the guys in the squad, and he's expected to use the same ammunition as the machine gunner in the squad. So that could be ball, it could also be armor piercing or tracer or explosive ammo. And Dragunov's design isn't all that accurate with that ball ammo, in part because of the, the twist rate that he chose to put into the gun. Now in 1974, uh, the Red Army would officially ask Ishevsku to change the rifling to the standard 762 by 54 rifling twist, which is 1 in 240 millimeters, or 1 in about 9 and a half inches, and that was ideal for the 148 grain standard ball ammo. It was less accurate with the precision ammo, it was but it was more accurate with ball, and it was more accurate with armor piercing and tracer ammunition that the sniper might be called upon to use, or the, the designated marksman might be called upon to use. So they deliberately made that choice. Now, you will often see Dragunovs referred to as, well, there are a lot of people who will spend a ton of money on Dragunovs because these are extremely valuable rifles in the US, and then people get their ego invested in how accurate the rifle is supposed to be. The actual acceptance requirements for a Dragunov in the Soviet military were based on three ten-shot groups. So these are substantial, we're not talking three five-shot groups, but a full ten-shot group, and three of them, uh, in order to be accepted with standard ball ammunition, it had to shoot no less than about five and a half minute of angle. You, need, you had to get all the rounds within a 14 centimeter uh, circle. It's about five and a half inches at 100 meters, which is worse than like World War II American, like that's worse than an M1 Garand acceptance requirement. But again, that is with this, the generic ball ammo. With the 7N1, which is the, the precision ammunition that was made, it was a little bit of longer bullet, had a, a part lead, part steel core to it, designed to be to work better with the, the twist rate of the Dragunov, and also made to a little bit higher standard. With that, you had to get those three ten-shot groups all within about three and a half inches at 100 meters. So the accuracy standard on this is not nearly what a lot of people think. Now it's perfectly acceptable for the role that the rifle was intended for, and it's a nice lightweight rifle, and there is a balance of what you can achieve between accuracy and weight. And if you want a super accurate rifle, the parts are going to have to be more rigid, uh, more stuff has to go into it, you can't have a super light rifle that's also super duper accurate. Anyway, the Soviets deliberately erred on the side of having the gun light, convenient, handy, and were willing to have an accuracy standard that, frankly, most people today would really poo-poo. Um, didn't prevent it from being a very successful rifle. These are still regularly used in service, the rifle's still around. There were a number of updates to it that were made starting in the 1980s. They went to polymer furniture, there were some experiments with bullpup versions and semi or, uh, fully automatic versions and folding stocks, and all that is beyond the scope of today's video because we just want to focus on the original. SVD, and I didn't even get into the PSO1 scope, which we'll have to do. I'll do that in a separate video specifically about the scope so that we can talk about all the various features on it. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Finding on the US market original Soviet military SVDs is really quite rare, so uh, I'd like to give a big thanks to Morphe's for giving me access to this one to film and show to you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.